So here's the question that seems to have everyone on X talking. Once full self-driving is solved, why do we even need AI6 or AI7? That question came from tech geek Tesla reacting to Elon's post about Tesla already reviewing AI5 with AI6 and 7 right behind yes 6 7 and AI8 supposedly out of this world. While at first I more or less ignored his question, it's had a ton of traction and is in all honesty a really fair question. Because if AI4 is already driving cars around shockingly well, well, why keep pushing? My answer is that, as many historical antecedents have shown us, good enough is not good enough. In fact, it's a door opening to a new potential that is much greater than anyone at the present moment can even imagine. Let's take a look. Hey y'all, it's Dr. Know It All. So this whole thing started with Elon's post on November 2nd. I actually talked about this in a previous video. You can check it out up here and at the end of this video if you're interested. I just sort of mentioned it in passing. But anyway, he said, just finished a long AI5 design review with the Tesla California and Texas chip engineers. It's going to be great. And AI6 and AI7 will follow in fast succession, which in my mind means we're probably talking about the late 2020s to early 2030s. So 28, 29, 30, somewhere in that range. And then AI8 will be out of this world, and that's probably closer to a decade in the future, just looking at the amount of time it's taken for them to go from hardware 2.5 to hardware 3 to AI 4 to AI 5, etc. And then of course he replied to himself, chip design review continues tomorrow, followed by Optimus demo review. And so this is where the question came up. Tech Geek Tesla on November 2nd, so just after Elon posted this, said, okay, this one has me really confused. Once FSD unsupervised is solved, why do we even need AI 6 or 7? Please, please help me understand. And then he tagged a bunch of folks, including me. So thank you for tagging me and I am replying to this. So there are a ton of reviews in this thread. I will leave a link to this in the description because it's way too much for me to read. Chuck Cook, as always, had a nice pithy response. Double solved, triple solved, then turn it up to 11 with reference to Spinal Tap, of course. And then Tech Geek responded to that. <laughs> Somebody made the point about phones and computers as if it was a duh answer. And I'm actually going to talk about that in just a moment. The big difference here is that computers and phones continue to evolve to support more and more software. Roads and driving situations don't change like that. What I fail to realize is that Elon's talking more about Optimus than anything else. I highly doubt AI 7 or 8 will be needed for autonomous driving, maybe AI 6. I actually disagree with that. I think that AI 7 and 8 will actually be used in autonomous driving, and I'll, I'll get to that in a moment. But anyway, you can see here that other folks, including Raj Duncan, replied that it's for Optimus more than for full self-driving. That very well may be the case, but in my mind, what we're talking about is opening up new frontiers, and why while AI4 is good enough, clearly it's good enough right now with version 14 of the software and some revisions to smooth it all out and everything, but it is good enough to drive in 99.99 something percent of all driving situations, which is, I would consider, as good as a human driver because we can't drive in 100% of situations either. So of course there is a good argument to be made that this is all about Optimus, but I think it's actually about everything. I think it's about expanding the frontier beyond what we can even really imagine at the present moment. As I'm sure you know, I'm constantly researching AI, Tesla, and technology, and I read a lot, but there's way more great content out there than anyone has time for. That's why I've actually used Shortform for almost two years now, and it's become my go-to learning tool. Shortform makes super-powered guides to the best nonfiction books, not just quick summaries, but deep, well-written breakdowns that actually teach you the ideas better than most people get from reading the book once. It's like having your smartest friend explain the key insights, connect them to other books, and show you how they all fit together. Take Never Split the Difference. The short form guide doesn't just summarize the negotiation tactics, it ties them to psychology and cognitive biases from thinking fast and slow, then compares them to classics like getting to yes. You end up understanding the why behind every strategy. And they've got guides across every topic, business, self-improvement, technology, even psychology and money. Plus new ones drop every week and subscribers can even vote on what comes next. And the newest thing I love, short form AI, their browser extension. It instantly summarizes any article, blog, or even YouTube video with one click. It's wild, and it saves me so much time staying up to date on AI papers and tech news. If you want to learn faster and smarter like I do, go to shortform.com slash doctorknowitall. You'll get a free trial and three months off their annual plan. Again, that's shortform.com slash doctorknowitall. Seriously, if you love learning but don't have hours to read every book on your list, Shortform is a game changer. Check it out. Link in the description and pinned comment. A big thanks to Shortform for sponsoring today's episode, and now let's get back to it. 
But before we move on to the future, let's talk about the present for just a second. May Musk reposted this. This is a lovely thing. This is something I've talked about previously, how people don't give enough credence to folks who are, have disabilities. As I get older, as I watched my parents age out of the ability to drive on their own, it starts to make me think about that. Hopefully, I've got about 20 more years-ish before this becomes a factor for me, but it could happen sooner, right? If I have health problems or if I have macular degeneration or whatever, if my eyesight goes, if my physicality goes, you know, all of that kind of stuff is possible. Anyway, Joe Nelson writes, and I will leave a link to this in the description as well, of course. You guys, my mind is blown. Elon Musk, you've given me and many other disabled families a life-changing technology. Tesla Full Self Driving brought me to happy tears tonight. I can drive my daughter around without anxiety, and I'm not limited to the sun setting or only driving small areas near my house or by my house. I am in awe. This is the future. This is good. Thank you. Thank you, Tesla community. And her video, which by the way is 13.2.9, so not even 14 of the software, she discusses how she has a degenerative eye condition and she can't really see at dusk and afterwards, and how full self-driving enables her to be able to move around and to drive in those later times. And quite honestly, at 60 years old, my eyes aren't so great at night anymore either, right? <laughs> when I was 20, I was like, I could drive in the middle of the night with no moon and no lights on or anything like that. Nowadays, I'm like, ooh, it's not quite so easy anymore. So I really do lean on full self-driving quite heavily when it comes to after dark, and my wife does as well. Misinformation has a significant eye problem that really, really limits her ability to drive after dark, and so it's really wonderful. This technology is already at present, enabling people to do things more safely and with less anxiety than they ever could before, and that is huge. But now let's go back to the future, and actually I just watched the 40th anniversary movie of it with my son last night. We went to the movie theater. It was actually a lot of fun, but the really freaky part was when Doc goes into the future, he goes, I'm going into the future 30 years years. That was 2015. So I was like, oh crap, the 30 years in the future is already 10 years in the past. So Back to the Future is quite a while ago at this point. But let's go back to the future. Let's rewind things. I know this is analogy and not perfect. It's not first principles, but I think that these are instructive antecedents. And I'm just going to mention these relatively quickly. We don't need to dwell on this. But the first one is Bill Gates talking about nobody needing more than 640k of RAM. Supposedly that might be an apocryphal statement, but whatever the situation, it's come down as as lore that somewhere around 1980 or so, Bill Gates said no one would ever need more than 680 kilobytes of RAM. Of course, now in my phone, I've got orders of magnitude more memory than that. And the important part is that has enabled us to do things like YouTube and stuff, right? I can actually shoot a video, store it on my hard drive, way more than 640K of storage there to be able to store that. In fact, just a small JPEG image is a couple of megabytes at this point, so it's already larger than that. That's not RAM, but you need RAM, random access memory, to be able to process all of that, to be able to edit videos, to be able to record this kind of thing. That door has been opened by people continuing to push the boundary and not saying that 640K of RAM was adequate. Another good enough is cars in the 1950s. They could get you around again, probably back to the future. I was thinking about that this morning. 1955 was when they went back to, and the cars were perfectly adequate, right? They could get you to point A to point B and stuff, but they were not safe. They didn't have seatbelts. They didn't have headrests. They didn't have airbags. They only had AM radios. They didn't have comfort features they didn't have GPS navigation, you wouldn't want to drive a car around like that as a daily driver. Now, people obviously still have vintage cars, and it's really cool that they have them, but you don't drive that around as your daily driver. You want something safer and more comfortable and more efficient and more useful and, and able to go at higher speeds. All of that stuff has been enabled. The ability to drive around like we can now has been enabled by the decades of work that have gone into cars since they were, quote, good enough in the 1950s. We can also talk about spacecraft. By 1969, NASA and the United States had landed people on the moon, and you could say that rocketry was good enough by 1969, and you didn't need to push the future, but we did push the future. We got the space shuttle. We, of course, got SpaceX and their amazing ability to launch and reland boosters. We have thousands and tens of thousands of satellites in orbit right now that people really probably couldn't have imagined so much in 1969. And in fact, I'm going to upload this video on Starlink, which is satellite-based internet. All of that would have been unimaginable back in 1969, so good enough was not good enough. For a more recent example, we can look at smartphones in 2007 when Steve Jobs introduced the iPhone. That was a good enough phone. That was really cool. It was a smartphone. It was a paradigm shifter, but it is nothing like what we have here. We have App Store. We have the ability to run artificial intelligence on our phones on the edge at this point. They can act as full studios. I can shoot a movie, edit the movie, upload the movie to social media, and all of that without ever touching a computer. That is just incredible, and that is stuff that's been enabled in the past two decades by 
good enough not being good enough. And just real quickly, we could also talk about medicine. By the time penicillin was invented, things were good enough, but obviously it's gone past that. We can talk about flight. Flight by the 1920s or so was, quote, good enough. But we, in the past hundred years, have made it way, way safer, way faster, way more commercially viable, and something that people do all the time that in 1925, very, very few people had ever flown. And of course, we have electricity. Electricity was good enough 100, 120 years ago or so, but it has evolved immensely since then. And we've got renewable sources of energy. We've got the ability to tie grids together. And electricity has become fundamental to our world. We can't even imagine existing without electricity anymore. And then, of course, dialing it way back, we can even talk about language itself. By the time we had cave drawings on cave tens of thousands of years ago, you could say that language was good enough, but it has clearly evolved and the technology of language has evolved. We've got the printing press, we've gotten written books, we've gotten movies, and on and on. So language has evolved and it has created things that are pretty much unimaginable to people a thousand years ago. They couldn't imagine what we've been able to do with language. So all of these technologies, some of them computerized, others of them much older than that, show how good enough is just opening the door to new frontiers, to things that were kind of unimaginable to the people who invented the original technologies. So with that in mind, we can relook at this post and we can think about it again. Number one, solved is not perfect, right? There will never be a 100% perfectly reliable vehicle on the road. What you want to do is continue adding those nines. And every time you add another nine, it's 10x harder. You're reducing the number of accidents by 10 times. That's not a trivial feat, even though it's 99.999 to 99.99999. There we go. Four of those things. It seems like it's a really, really small number, but that's 10 times less. That is a huge reduction in accidents. And remember that you can just be driving along and a tree branch can fall on your car or a meteor could hit your car or something, right? You could have something like that. You can never get to 100% reliability in the real world because just random crap can happen. But you can always strive to get closer and closer to that. So in my mind, AI4 is not the end. AI5 is not the end of full self-driving. Neither is 6, 7. Neither is 8. There will always be room to push this forward in terms of full self-driving, not even taking account of Optimus, just looking at driving. Just imagine in the future, in 50 years, we might be looking at cars that are driving 180 miles an hour on highways and 80 or 90 miles an hour in cities with no human drivers anywhere. And they are perfectly safe because their reaction time is so fast and they're communicating with each other constantly that if a kid ran out in the street to chase a ball or something like that, the car would be able to stop on the dime and all the cars behind it would be able to stop on a dime too because they would all know what's going on. They would have predictive capabilities. And so thus you could get around two or three times times faster than we can today with less traffic, less anxiety. And of course, you don't even learn how to drive as a child. You're just always a passenger and these vehicles are traveling around at those kinds of speeds. And of course, that's just my limited imagination. I'm sure there are other things that you would be able to do when cars are able to drive at a capability level that's, let's say, a hundred or a thousand times safer than the safest human by 50 years in the future. That's the kind of future that we're talking about. And AI4 will not get us there. It'll get us to the best human drivers. I'm very convinced of that. It will be very, very good, but it's not going to be 10 times or 100 times or 1,000 times safer than the safest human driver. That's where these later generations will come in. And especially with something so societally important, so impactful as automobiles and automobile accidents, like, it's huge. Having an accident is, is a bad day, even if it's just a fender bender. But if somebody gets hurt or, God forbid, gets killed, that is a tragedy. And so there is never good enough. You can never get good enough. So AI-8 won't be the end of things either. It'll be an AI-9. AI 10, etc. But then, of course, we could go beyond full self driving itself, beyond the cars. We can go to Optimus and humanoid robots, and there the sky is really the limit. These humanoid robots are very different than cars. They're both robots, but cars are designed to avoid interacting with anything, and they only have a couple of controls steering wheel, angle, accelerator, and brake. That's about it. Whereas humanoid robots have to interact with everything in their environment, and they have hands, and they have on the order of 80 to 100 different control outputs outputs at the same time. Much, much more complicated. So you can see that the headroom for this already will be much, much greater. And of course, there's a much larger diversity of activities that a humanoid robot can do. Think about the number of different kinds of things you do in a week. It is pretty remarkable. Everything from grocery shopping to driving to walking your dog to raking the leaves to mowing the lawn to washing dishes and laundry and putting that stuff away and folding things to going to the gym and working out. Or maybe if you're a climber, you climb or you're a martial artist, you do martial arts. You know, there's a lot of highly skilled activities that people do that we've spent
spent years or decades learning how to do. And this is something these humanoid robots will need to also be capable of doing. And so it's easy to understand how you could get to AI 8 and beyond in order to make these robots as effective as humans. And then remember, we don't have to stop there. We humans are limited by our biology. These robots could become 10 times as smart, 10 times as dexterous as a human being. That is certainly within future possibilities. So that takes us to the frontier principle. And that is that every problem solved creates the next problem to solve. As far as I can conceive of it, there is never any solution to that problem. Even if we became a galaxy spanning civilization, there is still other galaxies to get to. And there is still a universe that will eventually die in trillions of years that we would have to deal with. So there's always a problem, no matter how far you push out the frontier in your imagination, if not reality, you can always see another problem. And that is exactly what's being resolved by increasing the capability of these compute nodes. And of course, tying this back to human beings, you can conceive of us humans as the same thing. You learn to walk, but that's not good enough. As a toddler, right, you're just kind of stumbling around and everything. You go past that. You learn to walk well, then you learn to run. Then maybe you become a track runner in middle school or high school. And then maybe if you're really good, you go to college for that. And then you go to the Olympics or something. You can always keep pushing that. And of course, that's not just walking and running. You can do that for any endeavor that humans do, whether it's physical or mental. There's always a frontier to push. Otherwise, we'd be living in caves wearing bear skins and, and shivering because we didn't even have fire or anything. So we have solved many, many problems. There's always another frontier, another challenge. And that's exactly the reason why you need AI 5 and 6 and 7 and 8, etc. So that's my take on things. It's kind of an optimistic look at the future, in my mind at least. There's always something more amazing that we can do with our technology. And that means we need new technology. Software and hardware and computers have always done this stair step thing since they were invented nearly a century ago. So I, for one, am excited about the next several decades because I want to see just how far Tesla and frankly, we as a species can push ourselves into the future. Alrighty, folks, that's what I've got for you today. Let me know in the comments what you think about all of this. I have a feeling there will be more than a few comments about all of this. While you're down there, if you don't mind liking the video, it really helps other people to find it and consider subscribing for more of this kind of content. And finally, a big thanks once again to Shortform for sponsoring today's video. Be sure to check out my link in the description to get a free trial and three months off your annual plan. And I will see you in the next video. Bye-bye.